Have you heard about the laughter epidemic? It was the epidemic of uncontrollable fits of laughter that started at a girls' school and then spread across the country. It took place in 1962 in what is now present day Tanzania. The school where it started had to close and then it spread amongst the towns and 14 other schools were affected. These people weren't having fun or enjoying this laughter, it was very debilitating and went on for almost a year. Or what about the dancing plague? This took place in France 1518 when a woman stepped onto the street and began to dance, all by herself, to no music and for no apparent reason. She only got a few hours of poor sleep before starting again the next day. Her feet and body began to be in obvious pain. Then the strangeness really began as 30 others joined her in her spontaneous dance activities. And it wasn't long before the crowd grew to an estimated 400. Now this wasn't a dance party that people were enjoying either, it was described as involuntary, that people were in obvious pain and yelling for it to stop. As the days grew on and the temperatures rose, as many as 15 people died per day. The government tried all kinds of things to get it to stop, and even banned all dancing and almost all music. The death dance was a phenomenon known as mass psychogenic illness, a form of mass hysteria which are usually preceded by intolerable levels of psychological distress. These are two examples of harmful and bizarre social phenomenons that were contagious and resulted in people doing things seemingly against their will that was harmful to their bodies. But of course we know that these aren't just one-off random events, we see social contagions that cause self-harm all the time. This seems to be particularly prevalent among teenage girls. A 2013 study posted in Australia and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry called Anorexia and Social Contagion had this to say. During adolescence, female friendship cliques can develop an unhealthy focus on body image, dieting and extreme weight loss. These peer groups processes contribute to prevalence of eating problems amongst young women in westernized cultures. Community studies provided robust evidence for peer influence as a significant mediator in harmful eating practices amongst young women. Anthropological studies describe how peer influence intensifies within patient wards, residential units and day hospitals, which can become pro ana, with patients actively promoting the practices of anorexia. The power of the peer group becomes greater as young people are aggregated into harmonious groups in tertiary care. Mutual peer influence serves to intensify deviant eating practices in a process termed peer contagion. The study also went on to say that social media and online networks greatly increase the ability of peer groups formed in tertiary care to remain in contact with larger informal piranha communities. It also stated that within the peer group, nothing is more contagious than a behavioural example from a popular and influential friend. We know that young women struggle with eating disorders such as anorexia at three to four times that of young men. And as we've just seen, these kinds of mental health issues spread among friend groups. The same has been shown to happen with other forms of self-harm, such as cutting. It breaks all of our hearts to see young women doing these things to themselves and we have a great relief when we see a story of a young woman recover from those struggles and go on to live a healthy life. While we're on the topic of social contagion, if you saw my last episode of Family Matters, you'll remember that there has been in the last decade a 4,000% increase in the number of young women in the UK undergoing transgender treatment. Around the world, women are by far and increasingly so the leading demographic seeking transgender treatment, including here in New Zealand. And the fact that this explosion in number has a huge social contagion element to it is undeniable. US physician scientist Lisa Lippmann, whose research is focused on gender dysphoria, found that among groups of young girls that identified as transgender, a third of them had friend groups in which over half of the young girls began to identify as transgender in a similar time frame. This is more than 70 times the expected prevalence of transgender identity in young adults. So we're seeing increasingly high numbers of girls in friend groups all coming out as transgender at the same time, the same age as we see young girls navigating other social contagions that are harming them. Keep in mind many of these girls through the help of their peers and social media are self-diagnosing and can, in America for example, walk into a Planned Parenthood without any medical or even parental support, sign a waiver and be handed their shots of puberty blockers and testosterone. Some young girls are even having their breasts removed without so much as a note from a therapist. Here are some testimonies from women who experienced the social pressure and how they now see that it affected their decisions. 
I am Helena, I'm 23 years old. When I was about 15, I started using Tumblr. I had an eating disorder since I was pretty young. There was a lot of messages that said, if you feel bad about your body, that means you're trans. I was just going through this period of like, I don't like how I'm treated as a cis person. I don't wanna be cis because cis means you're uncool and you're privileged and you're an oppressor and you're bad and I don't wanna be that. In that way, I was really incentivized to try to figure out a way to make my voice heard in these communities. And obviously I can't change my race. I can't really change my sexuality. Um, so the only thing left was to start playing around with the gender stuff. So I decided to call myself a demi-girl, which is one of the 40 million genders. And that basically means that I'm mostly a girl, but I'm a little bit not a girl, which is just like, what does that even mean? And then after that, I went to demi-boy. And then after that, I went to gender, gender fluid. And after that, I eventually went to trans boy. But all this took like two or three years of just going through this repetitive cycle of changing this identity and changing it again. And it was just never enough. Ruby began identifying as male at 13 years old. Now 21, she'd been planning to have surgery to remove her breasts. But in May, she made the decision to come off testosterone and detransition to identify as female, her sex at birth. She doesn't want to be identified, so we've changed her name. I figured it would be better for me to try to deal with my gender dysphoria in a different way, rather than um, permanently changing my body. How much support did you feel was out there for you when you came to this conclusion? I didn't feel like there was any support out there, other than like a few friends online. Ruby now feels her eating disorder was more of a factor than she first realised in her gender dysphoria. None of the therapists that I spoke to um, brought that up. They didn't think that it was linked. Do you? I think so, yes, because it, they're both kind of based in how I feel about my body, so I've seen similarities between the two. I was approached by a young woman um, with a beard and she hugged me and, and said, I'm, I'm a detransitioned woman as well, I've just stopped taking testosterone. Um, and after that, I felt like I had to do something. I'm hearing from like, hundreds of people, um, and I think some of the common characteristics are they tend to be around their mid-20s. Um, they're mostly female and mostly same-sex attracted, mostly lesbians, um, and often autistic as well. I, I never fit. I was, a, I was an alpha female, a, a sales executive that kind of just didn't fit in any box. When psychologists or somebody that I was in love with or whatever said that I was in the wrong body, I started to think, well, maybe I am. I'm a biological woman that medically transitioned to appear like a male through synthetic hormones and surgery. I will never be a man. Is it transphobic for me to tell the truth? Why is it that a couple hundred years from now, if you dug up my body, they're gonna go, yep, that was a woman, had babies. Can you tell me about the procedures that you, you had? I've had seven surgeries. I've had one stress heart attack. I've had a helicopter life ride uh, with a pulmonary embolism. I've had uh, 17 rounds of antibiotics. I had six inches of hair on the inside of my urethra for 17 months. Nobody would help me, including the doctor that did this to me because I lost my insurance. I get infections every three to four months. I'm probably not going to live very long. Was there any real discussion of the risks and the side effects? And No. No, there's not. And I know that people want to think that there is, but there's not. The truth is, is that medical transition is experimental. We have um, studies that said that medical transition helps mental health, helps mental health with kids. They've all been retracted, modified, changed. But the only long-term study tells us seven to 10 years 
is when transgender people are the most suicidal. After? After surgery. But that's transphobic to say. All you have to do is medically transition and you fit in. I was one of those kids. It got me at 42. Your child doesn't have a chance. As you can see, the socially contagious element of gender transition is no clearer than for those that went down that path themselves. Young women and men waking up heartbroken about the irreversible damage that has been done to their bodies. And as they try to piece together how they got there, they can't look past the fact that they were in a vulnerable space and got swept up in the social hype. The victory we've seen recently in the UK with the Tavistock Clinic being shut down by the NHS is thanks no small part to the hero that is Kira Bell, a young woman who is a former patient of theirs. She brought a high court case against Tavistock, challenging their use of puberty blockers. Kira is very pleased to see the clinic shutting down. When asked to comment about the result, she said, many children will be saved from going down the path that I went down. The investigation on Tavistock found many disturbing things among which that health staff felt under pressure to adopt an unquestioning affirmative approach and other mental health concerns were overlooked in the process of giving hormones and surgeries. Remember, despite what the activists and media try to tell you, the rates of suicide do not decrease after transition. These mental health issues almost never just disappear. Those that suffer from gender dysphoria and transition still have a rate of suicide that is 20 times higher than that of their peers. So when are we going to start treating gender dysphoria in teenagers like we do any other mental illness? I mentioned earlier about eating disorders and you'll be interested to know that a study recently conducted in which 933 transgender people aged 14 to 25 were asked about their eating behaviours in the last 12 months and 75% of them reported having tried to lose weight through using pills, speed, fasting, laxatives or vomiting. 75% had done so in just the last year. Any of these activities show a mental health issue that they should be given every possible support to help address. Because we don't want them thinking something about them or their bodies that isn't true. We don't want them intentionally hurting themselves and not living up to their potential. We know what is best for them even if they can't see that right now. But they will be grateful later. We don't want toxic friend groups encouraging a self-destructive behaviour. Everyone agrees with this reality when it's an eating disorder, but as soon as large friend groups of teenage girls want to start injecting themselves with testosterone, causing horrific side effects and surgically removing their breasts or even sterilising themselves for the rest of their life, that's not a contagious mental disorder. That's them becoming their true selves. Never mind the fact that huge majorities of them are already struggling, sadly, with other self-destructive behaviours that are recognised as mental health issues. So we know their mental health is already compromised. How does Kira Bell look back at her mental state at 16 while she was making these life-altering decisions? She had this to say after the successful case against Tavistock. When I joined the case, I didn't realise how big it would become. What has happened since the ruling has been a roller coaster. Many people have thanked me. I've also been attacked online. If you're someone who regrets transitioning and decides to speak out about your experiences, you're considered a bigot. You may be told that you're trying to take away trans rights, that children know what's best for themselves and their bodies, and that you're ruining kids' lives. But I'm focused on what is best for distressed young people. A lot of girls are transitioning because they're in pain whether it's from mental health disorders or life trauma or other reasons. I know what it's like to get caught up in dreaming that transitioning will fix all of this. I was an unhappy girl who needed help. Instead, I was treated like an experiment. You might ask yourselves, do the surgeons performing these mutilations know about this reality? And do they care? Oh, they know. Do they care? Well, you decide for yourself. Do you worry that there, there could be a sort of social contagion element of this? A teeny tiny bit, maybe. It generates $1.3 million to pharma. And we're believing a pharmaceutical company, Lupron, hormone blockers, reversible, so they say. Well, the truth is, is that in 2003, Lupron was sued and deemed a criminal enterprise by the US government. They paid the most fine of any pharmaceutical company at that time, 
$874 million, wrote a check. Is Lupron chemical castration? Yes. We're giving it to pedophiles, aren't we? We're giving it to people that are dying, and we're giving it to kids telling them that they were born in the wrong body and it's completely safe. A marginalized group has a huge dollar sign on the top of their head. We have five children's hospitals in the United States promoting that. And what? That's a phalloplasty. That's a bottom surgery. We have five children's hospitals in the United States telling girls that they can be boys at $70,000 a pop in a surgery that has a 67% complication rate. That will kill me from infection that I can't sue on. We're butchering a generation of children because nobody's willing to talk about anything. I have three kids at the age that they're doing this to kids. I'm not transphobic. I love my kids, and I love other people's kids, and you should too. This is wrong. Money speaks. Fear does a good job of suppressing the truth when it's inconvenient. These people will not stop coming for the vulnerable next generation, which is why we must not stop pushing back with the truth. And as we do, and as brave boys and girls speak out about their experience and how they were manipulated and exploited, Tavistock will be the first of many to fall.